Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the SB 740 Charter School Facility Grant Program presentation. Um, we do appreciate how busy you are at this time, so we greatly appreciate and value your participation in today's webinar. My name is Katrina Johansson, and I'm the Executive Director of the California School Finance Authority. And since 20, 2014, the Authority has administered the Charter School Facility Grant Program, or SB 740. Since the program was transferred in, to CSFA in 2014, we have awarded nearly $750 million to California charter schools. And during the 2021 funding round alone, the program has helped nearly 400 charter schools serving 184,000 students. Today's webinar, led by Ryan Story and Jeff Martin, will provide application and program updates. We are also joined today by Shannon McCune, CSFA's new staff services manager. I did want to highlight that Treasurer Fiona Ma, Chair of CSFA, has prepared remarks on the SB740 program and her comments can be found on the SB740 webpage. Additionally, today's presentation will be posted on the SB740 webpage, so you should, should you have any questions, you can refer to the document or reach out to one of us with questions. We do, we do encourage participation and we um, encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A feature in Teams. And lastly, um, your questions will be answered within a week and posted on the SB740 webpage. Thank you, and at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Ryan's story. Ryan? Thank you, Katrina. So we just wanted to go over uh, the table of contents that we'll have for this webinar right here. We're going to start with the program overview, go over eligibility and best practices, an overview of the application, uh, go into details about facility agreements and independent appraisals, and then provide an example of how reimbursable lease costs are calculated. Then we'll dive into some quick statistics and data, some upcoming events, and then wrap it all up with the mentions of FAQs and any contact information that people may need. So with that, I'm going to pass it to my partner, Jeff Martin, to discuss some of the program overview points. Good afternoon, everyone, and again, thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Jeff Martin, and along with my partner, Ryan, uh, I, we are the lead analysts on the SB740 program. I'm going to uh, run through a quick program overview. So first off, um, for the 2020-21 funding round, the program was apportioned roughly $137 million for SB740, um, and as of the most recent proposed governor's budget, we are project projecting this to increase to $141 million for the 2021-22 funding round. Please do note that this is subject to change and we are currently working with the Department of Finance for the uh, May revise of the governor's budget and then eventually the final enacted budget. So we will have more information at a later date. For those of you that don't know, um, SB 740 or the Charter School Facility Grant Program provides an annual grants to reimburse for facility costs for charter schools uh, that are serving a high percentage of students eligible for free or reduced price meals or are located in the attendance area of a public elementary school that serves a similar demographic. Uh, the, th the threshold for uh, FRPM eligible students is 55%. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that uh, currently no funding is available for other non rent or lease costs, such as deferred maintenance, um, remodeling, et cetera, uh, due to the oversubscription of the program. For 2021-22, the projected cap on funding per unit of average daily attendance or ADA is $1,256 per the governor's proposed budget, uh, though this is subject to change as well both in both the May revise and the final enacted governor's budget later in the summer. The funding formula used to calculate awards is this uh, ADA cap of $1,256 per student uh, multiplied by the school's ADA or 75% of the school's reimbursable lease costs, whichever is the lesser of the two. So um, we'll just go through a quick example. 
um, if XYZ charter school were to have an ADA of 50.54 students, then 50.54 times 1,256 equals 63,000, roughly $500. And so uh, that would be the award based on the ADA cap. But if XYZ Charter were to only have reimbursable rent of $60,000 annually, $5,000 a month, uh, then 75% of this is 45,000 and we would take the lesser of the two. Therefore, XYZ Charter's 2021-22 award would only be $45,000. Thanks, Jeff. So for the eligibility and best practices, we wanted to start off with general eligibility, kind of a macro view of all the things we need to review in order to find schools eligible for funding awards. Uh, the large one that was mentioned a few slides ago by Jeff is the requirement that the prior year's FRPM percentage is at least 55% or that the uh, applicant school gives preference to a local elementary school that meets that 55% threshold. We'll go into more detail in the next slide on, on how to meet that, whether it be yourself or a, a local elementary school. The uh, applicant must also be in good standing with their charter authorizer have no conflicts of interest per our regulations and have no approve have no or have approved disclosures uh, with our legal status questionnaire. We'll go into more detail in the upcoming slides about those top four points. The last two a little bit more uh, self-explanatory. Uh, applicant school must be classroom based per CDE. So um, schools virtual um, hybrid. Uh, we would only use the ADA percentage that or ADA amount that is classroom based. So classroom based schools uh, would be are eligible. And also to kind of go off of what Jeff was saying about uh, there not being enough uh, funding or over we're oversubscribed to the point we can't provide other costs. You're not eligible for lease or rent cost if you are uh, located in a district or Prop 39 facility for those facility um, those lease and rent cost. Uh, portables are different, of course, but the actual facility, if it is a Prop 39 or a district facility, you're not eligible for uh, lease awards. You're technically eligible for other costs, but for this year, we just like to put that on there because we, we won't expect any fun, have enough funding to give any other costs. So wanted to go more into the first bullet point about free and reduced uh, uh, FRPM, sorry, <laughs> free and reduced price meal percentages. As mentioned beforehand, we are required to use the prior year's FRPM percentage. So for this round, the 21-22 funding round, we'll be using the 2020-21 FRPM. So again, it's one year back for the 21-22 funding round this year, we'll be using 2020-21. Lots of 20s there, but just know it's one year prior FRPM percentage provided by CDE. This has to be provided by CDE. It cannot be something that we handle disputes on our end. So if there's any changes needed or issues with the number provided to us, it must be handled by CDE. So it's best to start with them because we will just be redirecting you there as we're required to use CDE data. And as mentioned beforehand, applicants that don't meet the 55% uh, threshold by themselves may use a local elementary school as long as the preference in admission is specific and given in the current charter petition. So we have a lot of schools ask us, how can I become eligible to use a local elementary school um, with, uh, with, uh, without a material revision to charter? That is not possible. There must be a material revision in your charter if you do not give that preference in a specific way already. And an example of the exact word for word language to use is provided in the example below. This PowerPoint is available on our website. You can take that word for word, give it to your authorizer as a new uh, material revision in the admissions preference uh, section of your charter. And once that's approved by your uh, authorizer, we'd be able to use that local elementary school that does meet that 55%. You do have to have an elementary school that meets that 55% within your attendance area. But again, you cannot even entertain that thought without the preference being specific in your current and approved charter petition. Going on to the other um, caveats that require a little more detail when it comes to eligibility, good standing. In the last couple years, we've updated to a form that is sent to and completed by your authorizers. We will be sending it to your authorizers ourselves. 
you have it is to confirm that you're in compliance with your charter agreement. There's no pending corrective action or notice of intent to revoke. And if there's no response from the authorizer, we're going to presume that the school's in good standing because it has not been confirmed that they're not you're not in compliance with the two bullet points above. That is a new caveat uh, to this program the last couple of years. So put a little more onus on the authorizers to be forthright with any type of concerns. The next document is a legal status questionnaire. Uh, applicants that have been in the program prior years are very familiar with this. It's a form that discloses any type of legal, civil, criminatory, or regulatory investigations. Uh, we require that just to be able to run by our legal to uh, legal counsel to make sure there's no concerns on our end. There rarely, rarely is an issue with multiple, many disclosures provided to us. And so just being forthright on that and makes a lot easier and um, it allows for the process to get smoother and us to get funds out sooner. And last but not least, conflict of interest vetting. Now, conflict of interest vetting is a little bit more complex now that SB 126 has come into effect in the last couple of years. So there now needs to be a full disclosure of related parties and there's more details in our regulations, but it's very easy to break down in this way. A related party, it would be anybody that is on both sides of the lease agreement or facility agreement. No matter how many of the degrees of separation, if it's like if it's the master lease down to the sub lessor, if there's a related party, somebody that has voting or relationships between the boards that are approving this lease agreement, that we must be able to prove that they had no inf involvement or influence on the actual signing and approval of that lease. There are um, specific benchmarks we need to hit, they need to not vote, speak, they need to be abs have abstained from any type of uh, voter discussion in, t in meetings, and that needs to be provable in meeting records or in a resolution. Uh, so related party vetting is a little bit more complex, and so we always just encourage schools, just be forthright if you're even concerned about a related party, I would check yes in your application box and just allow us to go through the process with you. Um, you know, if it's uh, on the off chance that there's no concern, we can just move forward. But if there just needs to be vetting further and confirmation that there's no conflict of interest, a head start on that always solves the long term uh, process that it really is or can be. So I'm going to pass it to my partner, Jeff, to discuss a little bit more about the uh, 204s, which we will have more information as this process continually develops, but this is right now the information that's best for our applicants. Yeah, so um, one of the forms that's almost the most essential to the program is the pay data record or STD 204 form. Uh, the state controller's office uses this form to process awards and uh, warrants that are not able to be sent without an updated um, 204. A new 204 must be submitted in order to update a school's mailing address, um, in order to update a school's name, among other things. Um, th uh, this form is available on the California Department of General Services website, and there is a link at the bottom of the slide. Um, I actually just posted a link uh, in the live event Q&A to the most updated um, form because um, it was just updated this past month and released today. So we now have a, a revised version as of March 2021 that just was just released and uh, we were notified that no prior version of the form will be accepted um, starting in April. So going forward, we must use the revised 321 um, version of the form. It is uh, very important that in section two of this form, the business name is entered exactly as it appears on the organization's employer identification number or EIN as registered with the IRS, um, also known as tax ID um, number. And EIN information can be looked up on the IRS web website at the link on this slide. 
I will also post that in the live event Q&A in a moment, but you also have it available to you uh, in the PDF of the PowerPoint. Um, if the school's name is different from what is listed under its EIN um, as the nonprofit organization's name, then we will need to create both a parent and a child uh, supplier in our system. So the business name must be entered as exactly as the name on the EIN, followed by the letters D, B, A, and then the name of the school afterwards. Uh, for example, ABC Charter Incorporated DBA XYZ Charter Academy. And um, following up on, on uh, reasons to submit, a, a new form must be submitted if an applicant wishes to update its name, mailing address, uh, if, if the organization uh, for some reason has to receive a new EIN or tax ID number. Um, there's many different reasons why a form needs to be updated and we cannot mail warrants to addresses that are not listed on the most recent process 204 from the school. So um, the best practice is just to resubmit if anything material does change with the school. Thanks, Jeff. So now we're going to pivot into the actual application itself. So the application is available on our website at uh, on April 12th uh, this year. <laughs> the deadline will be May 14th, 2021 at 5 p.m. It's a little bit earlier than it has been historically, but we really want to make sure we can get out funds and awards sooner rather than later. And starting this process earlier allows for us to get a better head start on that. So this is one of the better ways that we can ensure a, a better um, outlook for award timelines. All applicants must use the online application. That's been uh, the way for the last few years. So if you have any issues, concerns, just please reach out to us. Being proactive is always a safe way to ensure that you're going to get your application in on time as no late applications will be accepted. Uh, we're pretty um, OK with the idea of if you have an open application and you just maybe didn't finish something or maybe didn't press submit, we're not going to have a hard line about that. But I have to encourage people to please start your application, even if it's just setting it up and you don't have the information ready to go. That will ensure for us to check in, make sure that the application does get closed in time and work with you to do it. If it's not there, we don't know if the application is open. We can't proactively reach out and get you to uh, open that application. So please, please, please do be proactive about that. Kind of diving in a little bit more to uh, the specifics on the application. So I know this seems a little bit uh, in intuitive, but just to ensure, please do submit your name, use submit your application using the school's operating name. We know all schools change names, have CMOs, have different DBAs. So please use what the name would be if we were to look it up on CDE school directory. That allows for us to populate information and get the spreadsheets required for this program going a lot sooner rather than checking names or confirming that things aren't abbreviated, for example. Documents that are uploaded to the application must be in PDF format. We do have a maximum file size of five megabytes. You do have a large petition or you have this massive multi-year lease with so many subleases that it's over five megabytes. Just feel free to email us at the SB740 email address that's provided at the end of the presentation uh, with your school's information and that in the subject line. We'll be able to attach that to the application, no problem. Uh, just an idea of some of the documents that have on hand, a current and valid charter petition or agreement, the actual authorizing resolution for said agreement, a list of the current board members, and if it's a CMO, a list of the board members for that level as well. A completed LSQ, uh, legal status questionnaire, as well as the certification signature pages. During the pandemic right now, as we're coming out of it, we're still having DocuSign available um, and acceptable for this. Um, and if anyone's curious or has any questions about that, that is for right now, but don't uh, assume that's in perpetuity once things get back to a more regular kind of office hours uh, physical kind of regulatory sense. But right now, go ahead and use DocuSign or 
digital signatures. And last but not least, other documents could include board meeting minutes, as we mentioned with conflict of interest. We wanted to be able to confirm that uh, related parties have abstained and not spoken, discussed, or been a part of discussions related to leases or facility appraisals, as we're going to go into uh, in the next couple of slides about uh, facility agreements and necessary appraisals. It's okay for you to have that appraisal done prior to application and then send that in with the application itself. All facility and lease agreements must be current and executed by all parties. We do, you know, obviously understanding when you're operating many schools or you're, you're you know, a small staff operating a, a single school, sometimes we get the uh, out of date or maybe the original copy of the lease agreement. Please just make sure it's current and executed by all parties. We're going to have to reach back out to you if it's not. Each lease agreement should be scanned and added separately. Um, and it should be saved using the convention below hand, our wonderful XYZ charter, 123 Main Street, and then the term right after that. For each lease agreement, we don't mean subleases or anything like that, just one per facility site. So if you have a master lease, a sublease, and then a sub sublease, please include that as one file. But if you are operating a couple different campuses, though you're one CMO, those would need to be uploaded separately with the convention mentioned beforehand. And if there is a new amendment or um, uh, the time order of the document should be newest to oldest or original. Um, that helps us save time when it comes to double checking and making sure that the uh, lease agreements line up over time if, that, if that's necessary. And then uh, I'm gonna pass it to Jeff right now to discuss facility agreements in more detail. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so that kind of leads us into going over the different types of facility or lease agreements. Um, the first being a multi-year facility lease agreement, which is any facility agreement unchanged and approved from the most recent funding round. So if in 2021, your school's site lease was eligible and, and an award was issued and the lease has not been renewed. It's still, it's still current and has um, time left to, till um, the expiration of the lease. Then, it is classified as a multi-year facility agreement. Um, and the second type would be new facility agreements. And a new facility agreement is a lease that meets one or more of the following conditions. Um, a, lease, a lease agreement for a facility not previously occupied by the charter school, so if, if a new lease is taken on. An agreement or an amendment that includes additional leased square footage to the current lease, uh, that is also a new facility agreement. Or a new agreement for existing facilities when the existing lease is up for renewal and does not contain an option to extend. There is one exception to this, and that is leases containing an option to extend clause within them. That is, if, if the option is executed in writing, those will not be constituted as new facility agreements. Um, here are just a few examples uh, of new facility or lease agreements. Uh, the first, XYZ Charter increases its uh, lease square footage by 50 square feet by an amendment to its current lease. This is going to be constituted as a new facility agreement. Uh, number two, XYZ Charter signs a new lease with a new landlord for the same site and square footage. This is also going to be a new facility agreement, even though it's for the same site and same footage, uh, same square footage, my apologies. Uh, number three, XYZ Charter exercises a renewal option in last year's lease. This is a multi-year agreement. And lastly, number four, uh, XYZ Charter opens a new site. This is also going to be a new facility agreement. For all new facility agreements, CSFA is required by education code to have an independent appraisal submitted for the site that is being leased. These appraisal requests are sent out if the applicant site or one of the applicant sites meets the following three requirements. One, um, the applicant meets program eligibility requirements. Two, the applicant has a site that is determined to be a new facility agreement. 
And lastly, number three, the applicant does not have an appraisal for the respective site completed within the last three years. If an appraisal has been completed within the last three years, then a new one is not required at, at this time. And uh, as for contents of the appraisal, the appraisal shall be consistent with the uniform standards of professional appraisal practice or USPAP. Uh, and it, at a minimum, it should contain the following items. Certified general appraiser licensed by the California Department of Real Estate Appraisers must complete the appraisal. The appraiser shall not be a related party as defined in section 10170.14 subsection A subsection 3 of uh, education code. And uh, that that's a uh, relevant to uh, something Ryan touched on earlier as for conflict of interest vetting and related parties. Um, and next, the intended, cli intended client shall be the charter school. The intended user shall be the California School Finance Authority for the Charter School Facility Grant Program eligibility. And last, the uh, appraisal must provide a fair market rent analysis, including a signed certification consistent with language found in USPAP. Um, on occasion, we've received appraisals that just include a uh, fair market value analysis and not fair market rent analysis. And we unfortunately, we're unable to use those because um, the value of the property doesn't doesn't uh, help us determine if it's being leased for a reasonable rate. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that uh, if you are going to be getting a new appraisal, please make sure to uh, include a fair market rent analysis for um, for all of our benefit. And all of this information is contained within an appraisal request as well as a link to a list of California Bureau of Real Estate Appraisers certified appraisers should your school receive a request. So we wanted to provide an example of how we come to calculate reimbursable lease costs because there's a lot of different caps and, and calculations that go into what we use to determine that 75% to use in the lesser than formula mentioned in the beginning of the webinar. So we're going to go back to our wonderful example XYZ, XYZ charter and show a kind of how as the charter evolves, how the lease agreements evolve over the over these five years presented in front of you. So we're going to start 2017 when XYZ charter opens. They sign a lease agreement for 25,000 square feet. Their actual rent is 100,000. There's no reimbursable rent from last year because it's just opened and it's a brand new lease agreement in charter school. They get a appraisal and the fair market the fair market rent for that facility is 125,000 per year. So they're getting a little bit of a deal and their appraisal sets the cap. And since the appraisal is higher than the actual rent, their actual rent is going to be used in the reimbursable rent cost. So $100,000, 75% of that $75,000 would be used as the lesser than formula with the ADA. It would just be dependent on the school's ADA on which one of those numbers would be used ultimately to uh, determine the award amount. So in 2018-19, the rent goes up $5,000. Um, we don't need an appraisal because now it's a multi-year lease. It's an unchanged approved lease from the prior funding round. Uh, the reimbursable rent from 2017-18, as we just discussed, is 100000 Because it's a multi-year lease, we now rely on the cost of living adjustment percentage or COLA cap to see uh, what the actual reimbursable rent cap will be without appraisal. So for 2018-19, it was 2.71%. As you can see, the calculation in the cap type column right there it equals about $102,000 or $103,000. A little bit less than the actual rent, but since it is the lower number, that number becomes the reimbursable rent amount used for the 75%. The next year, the same thing happens, goes up $5,000 annually. We use the reimbursable rent from 1819. The COLA now is a little bit larger at 3.26%, but as you can see, it's still a little bit below what the actual rent would be. 
at a little over $106,000. So that would be how a multi-year lease kind of operates from the appraisal cap to going through the lease, it's going through the subsequent years itself. In 2020 though, XYZ has had an increase in enrollment over the last few years and wants to expand uh, to uh, 2,500 square feet with their landlord. So they get a lease agreement for the same site, same landlord, um, you know, extended term, but the increase in square footage uh, triggers that new facility or the new facility um, threshold that Jeff was mentioning earlier, and that requires an appraisal. So even though we have a reimbursable rent from last year, it's not relevant because it's not for the same square footage, technically the same exact facility. So we'd require a new appraisal. It's after the three years as well. So let's say that XYZ uh, got one in 1920. They could use their appraisal because it's within the three years. But since this is the fourth year of that uh, act of that um, property, the appraisal would have to be a new one. And as you can see in the uh, chart in front of you, it's a little bit less at 129,000. COLA and reimbursable rent from last year, just not relevant there for information's sake. And since the cap is the appraisal, the new reimbursable rent for 2021 is 129,000. So it's less than the actual because it is the lower number. And then in 21, 22, we see the similar convention of the $5,000 increase. We use the prior year's rent with the expected COLA of 3.7. And you can see the reimbursable rent is uh, about $134,000, a little bit below what the actual rent would be. So as you can see, your rent, uh, the actual rent plays a part in what we use to determine the reimbursable rent, but those are not the same numbers uh, oftentimes. Reimbursable rent for most, most multi-year leases is typically based on the COLA cap or somewhere close to the actual rent. Um, and then, of course, the appraisals is just is just related to what property it is. I do want to stress again, as Jeff mentioned, this needs to be an appraisal based off of rent. It is really great if the appraisal is based off of the square footage as well, because it, let's say you're operating or you're um, yeah you're operating inside of two three classrooms or two three spaces in a in a more large facility, and that facility gets an appraisal for those three rooms specifically. If you expand in any way, shape, or form, we won't be able to use that appraisal to carry over. If the appraisal's on the entire building for the square footage, then we can go ahead and use that calculation. If there, for whatever reason, there needs to be a new facility agreement uh, determined in the next in the next three years of receiving that appraisal. So again, it should it has to be based on rent, and it really, really should be based on the square footage of the entire physical facility in which the school's operating in. It just saves a lot of headache and uh, prevents any type of delay if we have to go ahead and go back and forth to get a new appraisal and then wait for that to come in. And next, we're just going to run through some general statistics from the program over the last couple of years. Um, as you can see in both the table and charts below, the apportionment amount has been stagnant since the 2018-19 school year, but it will be increasing for the 2021-22 school year. We are just not positive how much it will be increasing. Uh, subsequently, eligible lease costs that are reimbursable under the program have increased by 13.82% in 2019-20, another 4.12% in 2021, and we are projecting these to increase another 2.31% in 2021-22. So due to the rapid increase in lease costs, the program has been unable to fund other costs as it has done so in, in previous years and has actually had to prorate awards. The pro rata rates in this table for 2021 and 2021-22 are estimates and are subject to change. And um, here's just a couple of uh, upcoming events that we wanted to go over. Um, on April 12th at 10 o'clock a.m., we will be opening up the 2021-22 funding round application period. And this application period will be closing on May 14th, 2021 at 5 o'clock p.m. 
Um, and then following that in early June, the 2020-21 true up process will begin. So we wanted to mention, um, as Katrina said in the beginning, we have a running frequently asked questions uh, document that's provided on the SB 740 website. We will update it based on questions that we receive during the, this session during our live Q&A. So if you have any questions, again, please do put that in the live Q&A. We'll, we'll be working to get back to everyone within a week. If your question is incredibly specific, of course, if we're not responding to you right now, we'll respond to you via email and it will be very um, you know, direct and specific. If we get a question that seems to be repetitive and general, uh, we will answer that question, but we'll also be updating the frequently asked questions. We send out a uh, notification on our listserv once we update those. So speaking of our listserv, please, please, I cannot uh, say how important it is to sign up for not only the SB740 listserv, but the CSFA listserv as well. Get general information about facility funding or our charter school programs. Uh, it's just a really good idea uh, to actually sign up for both. There are uh, link for the uh, website for SB740 is below. And then just if you work your way back to our homepage, the CSFA homepage, you can sign up for the listserv. It's in the same exact lower left-hand area of the web page. And then last but not least on this, our contact for the general program questions would be sb740 at treasurer.ca.gov. It's more of a generalized uh, email account that a lot of different eyes look over. So it's a good place for general questions. But of course, if you wanted to get a hold of us a little bit more directly, you can reach out to Jeff or myself at the emails on the left and the right hand side of the slide. Katrina, our executive director, who spoke in the beginning of the webinar, her email address is above. And then Shannon, uh, the SB 740's program manager, she is, her email is listed right above the schoolhouse. And then the actual general CSFA website where you can sign up for that listserv I was just talking about is below the schoolhouse in the middle. We really, really want to thank everybody for taking the time for our 2021-22 funding round webinar as this program uh, continues to uh, grow, we want to make it more efficient and be able to uh, improve the program in ways that will not only help us at CSFA, but also help all of you in meeting the educational needs of California students. So again, please, if you have any questions, do feel free to type them in the live event Q&A that's on the right-hand side of your screen, or email us at any of the contact emails provided. Download the webinar at our SB740 website, and please do look out for any e the email for the updated FAQ.